everybody. Welcome back to CORE. This is CORE, talking video games and the industry at large for Thursday, January 28th, 2021. I'm Scott Johnson, and that right there is uh, the one and only John Jagger. I almost said your full name because you gave it to me today. <laughs> and my wife and I were like, that's a cool middle name. I didn't know he had that middle name. Back and forth. And so I almost said it now because it's on my mind. But I didn't. So... There you go. <laughs> I would have thought I was in trouble. We would have been starting on a real tone. I would have gone, oh, I'm sorry, Scott. I don't know what I did. Did your mom ever do that? She's like... Oh, yeah. Yeah, full name. Yeah. It was always the full name if I was in trouble. That's how you knew. Yeah, I feel like we did that too growing up, but not as often as you'd think. Like, I would think most kids had moments where if you had a middle name, your parents would go, you know, Richard Flebius Griswold or whatever. And then yell at you and be mad. And if you don't have a middle name, I don't know what people do to you. What do they say to you then? Do you just say, uh, let's say your name is Bob Barker. Okay. okay. <laughs> you know, Hypothetical. Just a no one fake has name. That name. Yeah, so no name. Just, yep. I got to be careful with these old old entertainer names because I we invoked the name of Cloris Leachman on um, Wednesday's TMS. And we talked about her and how we loved her and everything. And oh man, Cloris Leachman, she's great. I'd watch her in anything. Anyway, moving on. And then she dies the next day. Just saying, what were we doing? What were we thinking? I got to quit bringing these names up. Anyway, Bob Barker, who's currently seventy-seven or ninety-seven, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Uh, let's say that's his name. Do they just go Bob Barker, or do you, or do you not do it at all if you don't have a middle name? Do you understand? What I'm trying to get to is the middle yeah, name. Do, yeah. Are we the only ones that get yelled at like that? Is what I'm saying. I think so. I okay. don't know. All right. I, to me, it's always you invoke the middle name when you're in trouble. I don't know anybody who didn't have a middle. Well, yeah, it's a good point. I know people don't. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. It's unheard of. But I I just can't imagine somebody getting just a double name or a single name if you're in trouble. Right. Right? Yeah, I can't imagine it even even if my parents didn't do the full name, I still got Jonathan. <laughs> you know, like my name got longer. Yeah. <laughs> they I were never like, Jono, I'm so mad at you. Like, <laughs> I never got that. Yeah. I was Scotty when I was in trouble. Which sounds more oh. jaunty like it should be when I'm not in trouble. Like, ah, yeah. Scotty, come on in here. But they would be more like, Scotty Blaine Johnson, they'd say. <laughs> Who pooped on the couch or whatever. You know, whatever it was. <laughs> is that a real crime? Did I want to make it up? clear that that is a hypothetical crime that I never committed. I did barf on the couch once um, because somebody drowned. This is a long story. I'll tell it anyway. What? what? Hold okay. Yeah, you can't tell. You can't set that up and not tell it. It's a fair point. All right, so here's how it went. Uh, where I lived, we had a bunch of flooding. This is in the mid to late 80s. I don't know when this was. Mid 80s, I guess. We had a whole bunch of flooding, and um, we lived near a river, and the river had crested and was threatening to kind of like come through the streets and get into everybody's houses in this place that we lived. And so... That year, we just had a ton of runoff in the mountains, lots of snow the winter before, so all this flooding was happening. So they had everybody go out and do sandbags and everything, and so we're out there doing sandbags and setting up kind of alternate routes for the water to go to avoid homes and all this, and everybody's doing it, got the sleeves rolled up, doing this thing in the community, and then in the middle of all of this, the cops show up, and they start roping off an area and not letting anyone near it. It was right by the river, and I'm like, what is going on? And they pulled a naked 30-something-year-old dude out of there. And he was naked because he had fallen in stream, way upstream, but this thing was so rough and so high that the the rocks and the debris and the stuff had torn all his clothes off. So it's not like there was some skinny dipper. Like the, the river did it. The river stripped him of his clothes. And they pulled him out of the river and put him on a gurney. And that was officially the first time I had ever seen a dead body. Like I just could not oh, deal with it. So at the time I was like, oh, whoa. But And apparently I was a little bit in shock and didn't know it. Because later that night, uh, I fell asleep on the couch for some reason. And in the middle of the night, I had a horrible nightmare about this dead guy. And I sat up, uh, freaked out, kind of had a night tear, and then ralphed all over this couch. Just blah! All over the couch. It was a little like Resident Evil 8, which we're going to talk about here in a minute. It was like a horrible Resident Evil style kind of moment for me. And uh, the best part about that was it took another day for my mom to realize what had happened because this couch was so ugly and the pattern on it was so like floral 70s ugly that you couldn't tell that I had barfed on it. Nobody oh knew. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Because you didn't remember. Yeah, I didn't remember. Right? Yeah, I was freaked out. Oh I, was, I was in God. shock, I guess, like actual shock. And uh, 
That messed me up pretty good. I think I was 12 or 13 or I don't know what I was. I, it was something like that. So I was, I was pretty young. It was pretty shocking stuff. And um, I mean, now I see that dead body every five minutes. What's the big deal? I was going to say, how many dead bodies have you seen? Because I've seen, I think, zero. <laughs> well, you've been to a funeral, so you've seen those, right? Like, that's different, I've though. never been to a funeral. Oh, you've never been to a funeral? Nope. Have you never had funeral potatoes? What? Have you ever had funeral potatoes? They're good. No. Oh, they're fantastic. So if, at a funeral, people will bring... <laughs> is that like the funeral version of wedding cake? Like, what is that? <laughs> So maybe it's a more prominent thing here, but when you would go to a funeral, you would bring a, you know, it's just as a nice gesture toward the family or whatever, you'd bring uh, what they would call funeral potatoes. It's basically like a potato casserole style dish. So uh -huh. baked in a big glass, uh, whatever those are called. Uh, tr what are those called? Whatever they are. Big long dish with two handles on the side. And uh, you put it at the table and people can slice it up and put it in their thing. It is the greatest freaking thing ever. Funeral okay, potatoes let me ask are you what amazing. I feel is a fair question. Yeah, yeah. And it was, by if the way, it's, so it's all cheesy and, and gooey and mm, so good. If this is something you bring, <laughs> doesn't that mean that the funeral doesn't necessarily have to be a part of this and this can just be a dish you make? <laughs> like, I'm very good at making shepherd's pie. It doesn't have to be funeral shepherd's pie. It can just be... It's a good week. I'm making shepherd's pie. You're right. Pie. You're right. This could just be called potato casserole or potato, whatever name you wanted to give it. But for some reason, you only ever saw them at these funerals. And they were always, even when you'd have them at like Thanksgiving, because that was sometimes that would happen. You would say, oh, we're, we've got stuffing. We've got this. We've got that. And we have funeral potatoes. Ooh, yeah. People would get excited about it. It's weird. <laughs> I, I agree. It's weird. Right. I mean, I guess, you know, good that you're finding some ray of sunshine <laughs> in an otherwise gloomy experience. Uh, that's a real that's a real positive. Well, let's see if I look up funeral potatoes on Google. Uh, uh -huh. Oh, there's tons of these. Um, Food Network has a recipe, for example. Let's see. Uh, funeral potato. Oh, this is totally it. OK, so I'm going to I'm going to put this in our discord. And you can They're see called this. funeral potatoes too. Why is it considered a somber food? Um, I mean, I find it to be like a super comforting food, uh, despite the fact that they are called funeral potatoes. Uh, this has a high rating too, so apparently this recipe is is well liked. But if you look at that and you think you've seen that at a, on a table at any kind of gathering, that is what we're talking about. And it's like creamy, cheesy, crunchy on top. My mom somehow involved. Um, cornflakes i don't remember how that okay worked, but sure I think that's anyway so here it is you preheat the oven nine by 13 baking dish heat a large deepness and six tablespoons of butter oh, all the butter oh my gosh it's so good it's so good yeah i will say this looks good i'm still a little thrown by the funeral nature of the dish but otherwise i'm on board with this yeah and i would are, eat this funeral or no yeah and there's a ton of results if you search for it so i'm clearly not alone but it, it's interesting i would have expected regionally which you, you and i are kind of in the same region you know same part of the southwest yeah. slash intermountain whatever we're connected we're, we touch our wieners touch the states i mean yes. and yes. everybody knows arizona <laughs> is doing a handstand <laughs> And because of that, I always think that everything's shared across those lines, but they're not always. And uh, this is a, maybe this is a, I think this is very big in like mid Midwest stuff, like uh, Minnesota and the Dakotas and things like that. I mean, so, it might be. I've never been to a funeral, so I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, it, it could be a thing here. I've just Daniel J. Been. Newman, he's saying prison potatoes should be the name in Arizona. I'm not sure what that implies, but sure. I, I mean, it's a crime to live here. <laughs> it obviously. is a crime to live there. No human should live under that sun. We know that part's true. All right. Anyway, hey, lots of game stuff to talk about. We missed last week as a result of uh, some other stuff going on. And uh, we're back, though. And it feels good. So let's dive in. All right. Microsoft released some earnings reports. And it was kind of across the whole company. It wasn't just games, although games represented a huge part of their revenue. But uh, they released a whole bunch of other data. And it involved everything from Office 365 to how their Azure business is doing and all those things. A bunch of boring business stuff. But, of course, they talked games. And there's a bunch of numbers with it, including uh, 
pretty much everything is up. Um, it's the single most, uh, the highest number of pre-sales, day of day and date sales, and consoles moved at a launch than any other product they've ever launched. Um, that's with constrained supply chain, which means there were, weren't enough to, to satisfy demand, but yet they still were something like 86% more than any other launch in their history, including Xbox One, 360, and of course, OG Xbox. None of that stuff's even come close. So that's pretty impressive on that level alone. One of the interesting thing, things was, um, and I read 24 million. This says 18. Um, that might mean, I don't, I'm not sure. 24 million might be combination of PC Game Pass, Xbox only Game Pass, and then Game Pass Ultimate subscribers altogether makes up 24. And 18 okay. is spread out. I don't know. But those numbers are enormous and all up by like huge percentages. Um, you wrote here, you thought that seemed a little low and I was surprised that well, you thought that number seemed low. That's a really, that's a big number it, for a subscription. It's a big number, but at the same time, here, here's my thought behind it. Why I thought, okay, so first of all, I had only seen the 18 million number, right? Um, 24, definitely a little better uh, or a lot better, I should say, but yeah. I don't know. It's just, I'm at a place right now where if I have to buy a video game, I'm surprised. Mm. The idea that I have to now pay money to play a video game is catching me off guard because services like Game Pass and all of that have provided me so many of the new games that have come out for free yeah. that it's starting to give my brain this shift to go, oh, all right, we, we buy games. That's something we typically do. And when I think about that, when I think about how many people freaked out about, and we're going to talk about it, the Xbox Live Gold price increase, yeah. and how many people are probably subscribed to Xbox Live Gold, I just feel like, why isn't this number, I mean, I would think Game Pass would have an astronomically high number. 18 million is nothing to scoff at, but it just seemed like. I, I, I think came it's out just, and I was like, huh, yeah. I, it's I just, it's like too new. Like I, that, my, my take on that is you're not wrong. It's like if, if gold, okay, let me, let me back up. If game pass had been around as, as long as gold and they were only claiming 18 million, that would be weird. But in a lot of ways, game pass, while not new, new is still pretty new. And conceptually, this is the year where they really pushed. This is where they said, look, we are going all in on this as a service and the PC thing was introduced year, year and a half ago. And like that, the breadth of what game pass represents for Microsoft, it's really been within the last 18 months that that has shown its actual face. So I'm not that surprised that, 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 that it's not, you know, in the hundred million yet or whatever, but it's still no slouch, even at 18, wherever that number comes from with the 24 that I saw, um, that's a lot of people. That's a lot. Like that's a lot. That's not, you know, Netflix numbers, but that's definitely better than, um, what was the other one I saw compared to it? It wasn't PlayStation now or not PlayStation plus. What was it? I saw another comparison that was more game to game and it was really good. Anyway, here's, here's basically what happened overall. They beat analyst expectations as a company at large, 70% year over year increase. That's the entire company, which of course includes that. Um, that means they reached forty three point zero eight billion dollars in uh, in profit. Um, they let's see, fourteen point six billion of that was from the segment of the business they call intelligent cloud. Uh, that's like Azure and all that stuff. Although that stuff is more tied to games now, as anyway, so it's it's hard to tell where some starts and some stops. But anyway, personal computing, which they include Windows, Xbox, and Surface, overall grew fifteen percent. Uh, the surface, if you take it out by itself, only 2%, which is uh, small, but still growth. Um, compared to the previous year with just over 15 billion, that included an 86% increase in Xbox hardware sales. 86% year over year. That is an, an enormous number. That is either that is either a sign that basically Xbox Ones weren't selling at all anymore, so you went from zero to 60 in like five seconds, or... That's probably mostly what it was. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, well, it's probably a little bit of both, right? <laughs> yeah. It's probably yeah. that they weren't selling that great, but that these also sold extremely well. Yeah, they did really well. And uh, the launch of the Series X and S uh, in November, uh, let's see, 
The latter number includes Game Pass. Microsoft's been pushing really hard as a core value proposition for the platform, blah, blah, blah. I'm trying to read down to where some of this comes into. I don't see that part. All right. Well, anyway, it, uh, they seem pretty happy, though, with the Xbox side of things. And such an Adela. No, no, no. That's no, that's him. I get the two. I get the two guys. The guy at Google and the guy at Microsoft mixed up. Do I have them right? It's Who are you talking about, Phil Spencer? No, the two main CEOs of the parent companies. I think oh. it's Satya Nadella at Microsoft. Yes, I have it right. The other guy is um, <laughs> they're both guys from India. They have Indian descent, so they got names that just I, they mix together because I'm a dumb white guy. But anyway, the point is, uh, they he was like, "This is the best our Xbox division has ever done." It sounded like all shiny shine from from that. So it seems really good. We don't have clear numbers yet on. Uh, Sony's earnings, at least uh, I don't think we do yet. I've been looking to see if we can compare numbers. I'm really curious how they did. I'm sure they did as well as they could do, given the limited stock supply that PS5 is represented. But I'm also guessing that some of those numbers may look weird because I don't think PS4 had the same drop-off rate as Xbox One did, which made that 86% increase seem huge. So Sony's right. a number might be. PS4 beef. was still doing pretty good right. at the end of the generation. You're right. And it that was a strong end for them. So they if their number looks more like 40%, it's going to be easy to look at that and go, 40%, that's nothing. Look at this 86. Yeah, but if you really look at the context of it, um, you know, it's Sony did just fine. I can promise you that. I mean, um, I think it's pretty safe to say, based on how <clears throat> sales of the consoles have gone, that it's almost a matter of how much they were able to produce and sell, because they've basically just been sold out. Every time stores or retailers have them, they sell them, is kind of the state we're in. We're only just now getting to a point where you're seeing, oh, kind of regular availability of consoles for these things. Right, right. And that's, I mean, this year is going to say a lot, because... How regularly available they'll be will make a big impact on growth uh, for both companies. So we'll see what happens. Now, part of this was um, news that they were going to change Xbox Live Gold pricing and they were going to hike it to be basically double what a six-month uh, gold... Uh, you know, and remember, good, the whole reason for gold even existing was, yes, they start doing PlayStation Plus-style occasional free games, but it was also this is how you play online games on our service, including free-to-play games. And they've been doing this since the beginning. Like Xbox Live uh, as a service has always been a paid-for service since the beginning. Yeah. Sony with PS3 uh, went the route of not charging for it, and now they charge for it also. Everybody charges for it in some level or another now. Um, but an increase nobody saw coming and, and really felt tone deaf. Like, really? You're going to... like it, What it felt like to me was they were basically saying... Well, that'll push you up to 10, which is a lot like 15. You may as well get Game Pass down to me. And like, it's just felt like this forced upsell to, to Game Pass. Yeah. Which I, you know, if I saw those numbers, I would do that. I would say, well, yeah, I'll pay the extra five and get Game Pass. Like, why would I, why would I stop there? But so I understand that, but it really did feel like this like sneaky little corporate bump to then push people that direction. And I know they want people going there. I get it. Like, there'll be a day when gold is, what is even gold or Xbox Live? It's just going to be an old term. Like, Game Pass is is the new thing, right? So I understand it that. It already kind of feels that way, to In be a lot honest. Of ways it like, does. the yeah. Games with Gold program, every time I see the games that are out with that, I kind of go, oh, they're really scraping yeah. the bottom of the barrel with that one. Like, yep. mm, I don't know about that. Um, yeah. Even paying to play the online feels like kind of an outdated thing i understand why they do it they've always done it these companies need to do it uh but at the same time you know saying like hey kids you want to get on and play Fortnite for free well make sure you're spending 10 bucks a month to pay for xbox live gold which is part of what they addressed which was how they're going to handle free to play online games yeah. but even the idea of paying a monthly fee so that you can play multiplayer in gaming seems a little odd yeah so they so that was and you, you alluded to it this is the other big big thing that happened so after all this hubbub and and in terms of like you know if you want to play fortnite or you want to play warzone and call of duty these these now free to play elements that are out there and they're gigantic games you still had to have at a minimum xbox live 
gold and you were being asked to to bump that up so you could continue to play your free games but not for free like it's just a bad look overall and nobody else is doing that right now and so they reversed it they got they got blasted with feedback the minute that announcement came out and they immediately turned around and said uh yeah we, in fact, I'll read it. He says, quote, we messed up today and you were right to let us know, said Microsoft. Connecting and playing with friends is a vital part of gaming and we failed to meet the expectations of players who count on it every day. As a result, we've decided not to change Xbox Live Gold pricing. So that means all the current tiers stay the same. No change there. But they went a little further uh, and they removed the need for that subscription for free to play games. So... That puts them at you know parity with others, but certainly in a better place to just let you play Fortnite without having to pay to play it. And I think, I mean, it's easy to go, well, you shouldn't have done it in the first place, but I actually think this is a great reaction and the right reaction and the right thing to do um, and to own up to it. Like they they freaking yeah. apologized. Like they're like, yeah, this was bad. It was a bad idea. We're not going to do this. They now. did it. They did it quick. I mean, you got to. That's the thing is I, I don't understand people that hold grudges on decisions like this. You know, it's one thing if a company, you know, makes a very unpopular decision, acts on it, does it for a little while, then goes oops and reverts it, but they've already kind of gotten the money, so to speak, uh, or had the impact. I I do think that there's something to be said about a company putting out the notice out there. They were going to act pretty quickly on it. But to have people immediately go, no, we don't like that, and them go, yeah, you know what? We agree. Yeah. Uh, I've also seen some people say that the plan to drop the gold requirement for free to play was always in the cards, so this isn't really something new. I honestly think that's kind of irrelevant, whether it was something yeah. they were going to do anyway or whether it was part of this reaction. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, people made their voices heard, hopefully respectfully. We know it wasn't true. And then they said, okay, you're right. Yeah. We're not going to do it. Yeah. I think it was the right, and it was just, it's just the right move. It's the right value for the, for the customers. Like you don't, I don't think you can yank around those people because a lot of those Xbox live gold people have been with you for a long time. Microsoft, like way back. Um, not these Johnny come lately game pass people. And so in a way you kind of need to respect that even a little bit more. And I'm glad they are. So that's how it is now. It still exists. It's staying at the same price. No change there. Subscriptions stay the same. Although, that and said, go to Game Pass. Just get Game like, Pass. What you, Either what way. You, what are you doing? Right. Like, <laughs> like, part of me knows why they're making that push because, yeah, go there. This is dumb. Don't do this. Do that. But uh, they're just in an awkward spot on how to transition a lot of those people. I get it. I totally get it. This was just the wrong strategy. So... I'm glad they owned up to it. We'll see how that all susses out. Um, now, speaking of the business. of uh, Oh, boy. <laughs> now, I'm actually prepared for this because here's what happened. This GameStop thing happened yesterday. GameStop stock, fiasco, short sell, freaking hedge fund nightmare. Okay. A lot of you listening, including myself, not the most versed in how stocks work, especially how hedge funds work or how short sales work and all that. I've seen the big short. I learned a lot. I didn't learn everything. I totally don't get some how some of that stuff works. They used Margot Robbie in a tub to teach me these things. And let's right. just say I didn't learn the lesson. I learned so. the lesson I learned was not the lesson they intended me to learn from that. No. Um, the also, it annoys lesson me. I learned was I'm okay with a movie having Margot Robbie talk to me in a bathtub. Yes, That's that, that, what I that works out pretty good. Although it's a little gross if you think about the fact that I guess it, the book that it's based on that was based on actual people and events that was a historical novel not a uh you know it was, it was like in a documentary type what am I trying to, nonfiction okay is what it was right and one of the key players in all this was a woman and they instead so it was four guys and a woman they instead decided to make it about five guys and then really the only woman in the movie is margot robbie naked in a tub it's a little it's a little on the nose for you know for kind of how Hollywood works, but whatever. It, it, aside yeah. from Hollywood, that, and and honestly, based on the things I saw in that movie, those people probably yeah. uh, that mentality in general. Yeah, but. there's a bit of that. So I don't know how to feel about that, but I do know that um, 
my understanding of that some of that stuff is pretty surface level. I'm not somebody who plays around the stock market. I have friends who day trade and 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 you know lose their shirt every couple of months and make it back just barely. And you know I don't. It's just a lot of gambling basically in a lot of ways. And um, some have called it the the world's biggest and largest casino. And usually it's very exclusive to millionaires and billionaires and individual investors who get to just throw money around, make money, lose money, whatever. And it's not normally something that you and I get too concerned with. The way that you and I get concerned with it is our retirement funds at work or wherever we're doing it, we put into a fund. And that fund is a fund that's shared across various investments. And it's, you know, we hope it pays off over time. Uh, even then, no guarantees. But it's just this like small side thing that we hope to have for retirement. That's kind of the extent of my big knowledge of it without seeing like, you know, Wolf of Wall Street or freaking the Big Short or any of these things where you learn about the real insidery business of, you know, what daily Wall Street stuff is. So all of that being said, here's how it happens. Yesterday or Wednesday, the news pops that Game Stops Stock. That's right. The store John used to work at one of these. Uh, mm -hmm. GameStop, the store in the mall, the place you go to trade your games in, whatever, which has become less and less relevant over the years. That place has a terrible stock value and has for a long time. It's very low. And suddenly Wednesday, it was sky high and growing and nobody could figure out why until they did. They all figured out what happened. So basically, here's the primer on what happened. I found this on Reddit. This is just a brief ex explanation um, of what actually happened so that people can understand it. I don't think this is boring at all. I think it's super interesting. So I'm, I'm going to read it. All right. So here we go. Uh, I'm going to start over here. It says, first, you need to understand what a short is in trading. Okay. John, before today, did you know what a short was? I didn't until somebody put it in World of Warcraft terms. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I got it. <laughs> Sometimes we need that. I often need yeah. that. So I get that. But let's hear this explanation because I think it's probably equally as good. But yes, somebody put it in wow terms and I went, I understand. Yeah, some, sometimes we need it in the language we speak. But anyway, the short is when you borrow a stock. So borrowing a stock from a broker and sell it immediately at its current price. So you're not buying it to hold on to it to see how it does like, a, like you would normally think of the stock market. You're going to immediately turn around and sell that borrowed stock, which again is weird in its own way. But Whatever. That's what that. That's what a short is, and this is common. Been done forever, since the dawn of this stuff. It's nothing new. Um, when you hope the stock's price falls such that you can buy the stock back at a lower price and return the shares you borrowed to your broker, but keeping the difference. Okay. Yes. So that's pretty simple to understand so far. So here's an example. Let's say you want to short an X Y Z. That's the company, uh, which has a current price of ten bucks. So you borrow one share and sell it immediately at 10 bucks. And then you have 10 bucks now, but you owe the broker the one share that you borrowed. Okay. Yes. Then let's say the price of XYZ drops to seven bucks. Now decide to cover or buy it back my short position and buy one share at $7 and return the one borrowed share to my broker. And by the way, the way these returns he's talking about are usually set in stone, like there's a date. So when you short buy, you kind of start a clock and that clock, I think it may vary, but it's like, all right, well, in a month, I owe you either the money or the stock that I borrowed. I either owe you the money right. would have that the current value of that stock is, or I owe you the stock I borrowed to begin with. And that's, you know, that's, you can't get around that. Those dates are locked, which is why the three weeks before this is kind of a big deal. Anyway, uh, where was I? All right. So uh, my short position, buy one share at seven and return the borrowed share to the broker. I made $10 when I sold and only had to pay seven to buy it back. So my profit on it was three bucks, okay? So you made three bucks on the deal. This is, again, very common, very normal. Everybody, this is what Wall Street does, or it's one of the things they do. Sorry, my eye itches and I have to scratch it. Okay, Whew. that has nothing to do with the, with the story. All right, it says, now let's say that instead of XYZ price dropping to seven, it goes up to 15. I still need to return the one borrowed share to my broker, except now it's going to cost me a lot more to buy it back. If I buy it back at 15 so I can return the borrowed shares, my losses will be $5, which is the difference between the 10 and the 15. Okay, makes sense. Since the price can rise indefinitely, my uh, potential losses as a short seller are unlimited. As some point out, I have to buy it back to return the shares I borrowed. The more the price rises, the bigger my losses. Okay, so on to GameStop. This is where this, is where this gets applied. 
a few weeks uh, ago, a redditor on the slash or the r slash, sorry, the Wall Street's bets subreddit is what I'm trying to say, which is a very active sort of amateur, and I don't mean amateur like lame. I mean like you know, you and I are amateur podcasters or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like they're just yes. They're I don't have to probably explain this. That's why I don't know why I am. Uh, <laughs> anyway, they noticed that a hedge fund had taken a massive amount of short trades against GameStop. All right, so a hedge fund meaning that's basically a company. It's a it's a group that does these hedging bets on where they think companies are going to go. And they try to do a lot of short selling in that and basically artificially pump up the value of a company so that their short sales can be profitable. So they're basically always doing what these subreddits are now being accused of doing, which makes this culturally relevant. Anyway, so they convince everybody on the thread to join. All right, they join forces and they buy as much GameStop uh, stock as possible, as much as they get their hands on. This made the price rise in the hedge fund short position start to lose billions of dollars. Okay, so that stuff started in the green, and by the end of the day, or by the end of that three weeks, and by the end of Wednesday's trading, it was billions to the point that one hedge fund and or quote company completely bankrupt, <laughs> wiped off the face of the earth. Because of GameStop uh, uh -huh. uh, stock. Okay. So here's, let's go back to this. So this price, blah, 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 okay, their losses even surpassed the $13.1 billion that the hedge fund was worth. Eventually, the hedge fund had to close their short positions and buy all the GameStop back at much, much higher prices, sending the prices even higher still. This is called a short squeeze. Now the hedge fund is declaring bankruptcy and the Reddit thread is com uh, combing through other hedge funds with massive short exposure so they can short squeeze them into bankruptcy as well. So there's a little bit of trolling going on here. All of Wall Street is saying that the public joining together in this fashion should be illegal, but really they are just losing at their own game to the masses. Uh, uh -huh. that, that is kind of not disputed in my mind. Like you can have, you can be pro Wall Street. Don't know why you would be because don't give a shit about some rich guy who makes money off other people, but but whatever. You can be pro Wall Street in this story, or you can be pro the masses in this story. The one undeniable fact about all of it is the rules are there, and no one's broken any. <laughs> like, they just did what they do all the time, and they just did it in a massive, like, striking kind of way, and it just hosed, hosed these hedge funds. It has very little to do with GameStop. The reason GameStop was chosen is not because they're all sitting around going, Hey, man, we're gamers. We should choose GameStop. Yeah, man, because we're gamers. That didn't happen. That's not what this is. They were looking for tanking stocks, stocks that basically people try to do this short sell trick with because they're not going anywhere. There's not growth in the foreseeable future. Their business models are kind of dying. GameStop, how yeah. many times we talked a million times about GameStop is at the point where they're going to start to they die. They weren't looking good before the pandemic. Right. They certainly don't look good in a pandemic world. Like GameStop is struggling to find its footing yeah. at the best of times. So what really frustrates me is people want to, who want to turn this into a conversation about why game of all companies, why GameStop? Well, no, that's why. It's not having any it's easy because it's us and the world we live in as nerds and gamers. We want to see the connection here, but there isn't one. It's just that was a target for short for short selling and they did it. The same thing happened right after this or during this to AMC, also struggling mightily and not having a great stock time. Their values went way up and people had to short sell and made and made huge losses as a result. Uh Nokia, uh Blackberry. Are you seeing a pattern, John? <laughs> these are these are these are companies that are not not that they're irrelevant, but they are kind of irrelevant. Or they're becoming yeah. that. They're, 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 that's the whole point. So if the argument from billionaires and millionaires and hedge fund owners and hedge fund runners and all that, if their argument is this should be illegal, then they're basically arguing that them and a huge portion of all of their wealth should also be illegal. Hedge funds do this exact thing all the time. And the rules are no different. And so basically it's like some smart kid walked into a casino and the casino has some rules. You can't cheat. You can't, you know, count cards. You can't do a bunch of other stuff. You can't use cameras or whatever your rules are at your casino. But somebody's just really good at, at play, playing the house and figuring out how to not just win, but how to screw other people over. That's just what happened. And there's no, 
the difference here is you can't, there's no mob boss who runs the casino who can say, we really enjoyed having you here, but we'd like to see you leave now. Thank you very much. Here's a free voucher for whatever. Well, what if we don't want to leave? I'll have to kill you and bury you in the desert. Like that, that's not going to work this way, right? This is a big regulated out in the open thing. And they just did everybody else. They did what everybody else did and beat them. That's it. So I am not pro this, this behavior and I am not anti this behavior. I don't want anything to do with this behavior because either way, it's a gigantic risk on either side. It's literally gambling. And in this case, it's gambling against odds that you hadn't counted on. So I don't want, I want nothing to do with any of this uh, from, from a personal or financial standpoint. But this concept that this, this idea that, that we should all stand behind the grasshoppers when the ants came in and realized there were more of them than, than grasshoppers is, is stupid. Like it's stupid. Either this is either, either the rules apply to everyone or they don't. So if you don't like those rules, I guess we can go through a bunch of regulatory hoops and figure it out. And there'll probably be hearings about this and we're not even done with it because this is an ongoing thing to make matters worse though. Uh, Robinhood, which is a service and an app tons of people use outside of the, system, the the normal like insider systems to make trades and stuff. They re- they're literally named Robinhood, who took from the rich to give to the poor. The whole concept of Robinhood is to let other people into the markets and compete in there and gain profit, gain value, whatever. That's why they exist. And today, they were pressured to shut down trading on all GameStop, all all these different funds or all these different um, stocks that were getting messed with, they shut down <laughs> they shut down trading on all of them to kind of slow the bleed. Which now I think should make them legally change their name to the Sheriff of Nottingham. I think they have to go ahead yeah. and do that. That's, they got, that's what they got to do. That's yeah. the rule. But it is funny, um, strange here- bedfellows and all that. Like, and they're politicians from like the most opposing positions right now. Like I was yeah. looking to the AOC over here, Ted Cruz over here. There's others, but they're the big one. Agreeing with each other about this today. And that doesn't happen for anything in this. In this, they all united world. under GameStop. Yeah, the one thing everybody can agree on: GameStop. <laughs> yeah, they all want. Pa- where's my Game Informer? Players. And uh, can I get scratch, <laughs> scratch and dent resistant uh, insurance while I'm here for my Madden 2020, please? Here's so, yeah. my big takeaway from this, Scott. This is this is what I I need to come from all of this. In however many years it is, yeah. When a new Animal Crossing game comes out, <laughs> when can we start doing short uh, shorts on the turnip <laughs> stock market? Because every time it's like, hey, is the prices on turnips going to go up? But I want to be able to bet that the prices on turnips are going to fall yep. and make more bills that way. Yeah. Yeah, why not? Can we add new systems to uh, to the existing thing? In fact, take New Horizons and just tweak it. Let's let's, let's get yeah. short selling in, uh, in Animal Crossing. I'm ready. I mean, this this GameStop thing has now made everybody an expert on the stock market. Yeah. So I think they can really just change Animal Crossing and just really enhance that. Yeah. We're gonna be rolling in the bells. <laughs> oh yeah, saying. totally rolling in the bells. I love that uh, Adele song. It's fantastic. Rolling no, in the bells. Nook is gonna get paid. Oh, Nook always gets paid. So here, here's here's my my other uh, my other kind of thing at the end of this. Um, like I, how do I put this? I actually think it's good for society when regular people can punch up into the private spaces of the rich and powerful. Um, and that's kind of what this is. And as much as I wouldn't touch any of it with a 10 foot pole, because here's the other thing is there are people involved in this that are trying to make this happen, including like big names, like Elon Musk did some stuff and was like buying up, but because they love screwing other screwing over other billionaires. These are the games they play. All right. But the just regular people doing this, some people are going to lose a bunch of money. Like it's going to hurt to be involved in this. And other people uh, on the financial side, the, 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 the regular financial side, the establishment, they're going to get real stung by this and, and the ramifications of it and the fallout from it and whatever else happens with these dominoes as time goes on. Um, but I'm never going to vote for, for who's punching down. So I don't want anarchy. I don't want, 
you know, <clears throat> I don't want systems to be messed with, certainly when we're talking about Ill illegalities, but that's not what this is. So right now I'm kind of I'm kind of with the ants cuz I'd rather freaking punch up, dude. Our grasshoppers are dicks. Like, you know, freaking uh who's the main grasshopper in uh, Bugs Life since I keep using this scenario? Uh what was his name? Uh, the actor is in trouble now for for raping somebody or something. What's his name? <laughs> I can't think of his name. What? The guy on uh, that had the show on on Netflix. Uh uh uh, he, the character is Hopper. He was played by uh -huh. Kevin Spacey. That's it. Kevin Spacey. Oh, is that the voice of Hopper? I yes. have no idea who played his voice. Ke Kevin, no wonder you look so confused as I was trying to dig my way through these weeds. Um, but well, yes. I mean, there was that. And also I got distracted because apparently Microsoft just tweeted out the trailer, the gameplay trailer for Werewolf the Apocalypse, half man, <laughs> half wolf, all bite. So I needed to see if that was news relevant, seeing as we were talking about news right now. Wow. And uh, I, I don't know if it is. <laughs> I don't know how good it looks or doesn't look. I don't even know what to say to that news. That's probably good news is the thing. But I, I guess what I'm saying is, I guess I don't, I mean, again, no expert in any of this stuff. I've got my rudimentary understanding of it. And um, I think that it's pretty rich, for lack of a better term, for the 1% of traders who move billions around every day of ones and zeros and don't really have, a lot of this money isn't even real. Like, to see them have to, pretend to be all pearl clutchy about this is pretty freaking funny to me i mean give me a break guys like i i don't i uh, is i sure this must be really frustrating if you're in that world if you're in that business this is frustrating as hell bunch of redditors came out of nowhere and did what to the where and the who but you shouldn't get to just have your your shitty little world and no one else can crack it like let them punch up a little bit I don't like people to punch down. I like people to punch up. All right, John. That's the end of that story. We've done all, all we right. can do there. Yeah, uh, I think we've covered it. If we... you guys have feelings or thoughts, let us know. Let's talk about RE Village or Resident Evil 8, which I refuse to call it Village because I hate the... Those letters aren't really the numbers in there, even though they're highlighted in a different color and totally are... <laughs> I hate that. That's so annoying to me. I'm sure they're not... Yeah, I... You know, the next I... one's going to be called Nine... We already know it. It's not like they're going to go, well, that wasn't really eight. That was village. Yeah. That's what they'll say. But I know. I know the truth. We uh, all know. This is Resident Evil 8. Yeah, 8. It's and they showed Evil. a bunch of stuff. Trailers and some gameplay and uh, some idea of like kind of thematically what we're looking at and all that. And all I could think of was John's going to be stoked about this because he'll get to make fun of me when I play it. Mm -hmm. If I play it. And you know my rules on this. Someone has to buy that game and give it to me for nothing. I'm not paying Someone for scary Someone will give games. it to you. I'm okay. sure they will. Whoever that ends up being, whatever benefactor we attract, then the rule is I stream it in its entirety and John backseats the whole time with commentary and advice as I do so. Now, usually what ends up happening is you will play one of these games, especially the the remakes of the older ones. You'll You'll have played it either multiple times or at least once and know everything. And yeah. then lead me astray for 12 hours and try to make me do dumb stuff. But even if you haven't played it yet, even if I play this at launch and you watch me do it or play along with me, I still expect you to try to send me in weird directions and get me killed. Oh, I'm not going to hide scares from you. Yeah. I, I will say this. You had a really good time uh, and not fun, but like time with which you progress through the game on resident evil three yeah you did quite well yeah it was fun uh but i didn't i didn't hide scares from you i sometimes led you to them yeah and so, you'll do that you know yeah well it's, here's my question with eight fair. uh so eight has this tall lady uh there's everyone talks mm -hmm. about the tall lady it's become quite the little meme monster uh that tall lady and uh um what i want to know is there is there a little grandma on a chair again or not do I have to worry about her? Because that know. was, oh boy, not my favorite. The tall thing. lady sits in a chair. How do you feel about tall women, Scott? Um, they intimidate me. I'll admit it. When I was in high school, yeah. I dated a girl who was supermodel, good looking, like beautiful girl. And I was lucky to have asked her out and she said yes. And I was nervous asking her and I was nervous the whole time. 
because even though I was six foot three in high school, she was six foot four and a half. <laughs> so she was like just enough taller than me that I just it intimidated the hell out of me. And she was gorgeous. But I took her on this date, was nervous the whole time, and I was driving a Yugo because my dad, okay, it's a long story, but my dad used to import cars, not import, buy cars in California at auction, bring them to Salt Lake, fix up whatever needed to be fixed it up, fixed up, including bullet holes occasionally. And then he would resell them at auction here to like dealers and stuff, car dealers. And there was a bullet hole once, and that's a different story. Um, basically, we had a bloody chair in our garage for like six months. It was weird. Anyway, so this, he had a, usually it was like, oh, a 300 ZX or look what we get to drive this week. Some kind of hot uh, Toyota MR2, a little roadster beast. And it was great for dates. But then sometimes I just catch it at the wrong time and all he had was this Yugo. And if you remember before the Yugoslavian country died and went away, they had a car and it was called the Yugo. And it, it was like their big export and it was a piece of literal shit is the worst car ever made, I think. And we had one. That's a great name, though. I mean, sure. But it was just, garbage. Garbage car. I just think we need to acknowledge that their naming game was on point. Yes. And this is an old TMS story. Some of you have heard this. But uh, I'm driving this girl around on that date, and the steering wheel popped off on them in an intersection while I was trying to turn. Just came right off the, the freaking steering column. And I had, I had my dad come get me. So not only was I intimidated by her, not only did I already feel like a, a weenie because she was taller than me, better looking than I would ever be or any other girl I'd ever date. And then the car, the steering wheel came off and we're in a Yugo. Two of the, I'm tall, she's really tall and we're both crammed into this thing like clowns. It was so bad, John. Ugh. Ugh. Where's John Hughes? All right, need so him? That, yeah. that was a person who was about an inch taller than you, an inch yeah. and some. Yeah. How do you feel about a nine-foot-tall woman? Uh, if she's dressed like it's the late 18th century, then maybe we could have we could talk. And she has finger knives. Oh, well, then now we're... Forget it. I'm out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, good. She has, she has all these things, it turns out. Um, what do we know of the vampires? Is she supposed to be one? And are they all... Yeah. She's... Okay supposed to be a vampire thing there's also supposed to be werewolves in there it's the continuing story of uh ethan from seven uh you know the faceless first person protagonist ethan yeah and uh, apparently He's... he and his his wife have moved to the most bizarre place on the planet to get away from it all and now wait did i get did Ooh. she get saved i thought she oh yeah she did yeah, get saved she got she got saved. Well, maybe. Actually, I think there are two endings, one where you don't save her and one where you do. But I think they have named one of those versions the canonical uh, version of her, yeah. uh, of the story. And it's where uh, she lives. Okay, so let's say, okay, so she made it. I would have, uh, the divorce would have been in the in the wings for us, for me and that character, I'm afraid. No, you, can't... you don't, you don't. Oh, I can't. She go couldn't help that. it, Scott. She I know, but you. It's, but that's the same as me. Okay, let's say I married. Uh, let's say John and I got married. Okay. And I'm the female in the group. It would be male. Who cares? Whatever. But the, you and I get married. Okay. And six months into the marriage, I just start farting like there's no end. I can't stop. <laughs> okay. fart, 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 just constant farts all day long, every day. Never a moment where I'm not farting. And boy, howdy, does it stink. It's like a sulfur mine in that house. Just horrible. Okay. You still like me and you still want me to be there and stuff, but you can't go on like that. And that's how this is for me. She became a giant sulfur fart in no, that but game. You got, you got better. This would be the same analogy, but I got you some some prevacid or something, <laughs> and we, we put that to an end. And now uh, the relationship can go back to how it was, except for occasionally maybe you get a phantom whiff of something and you're like, but is it back? Yeah. You know, and that's, you know, that's what you work through. That's okay. why you move to a freaky vampire commune in some <laughs> random country somewhere. So, all right, fair enough. I pictured the lady at CBS selling you the Prevacid is a giant tall lady in 18th century <laughs> clothes. So. <laughs> Well, anyway, this is all what you're getting. It's happening. It's happening May 7th. It's coming to current and last gen consoles. Remember current being the new ones. Which was really weird because during the video for the announcement, they said, and 
we are going to be developing this for current gen as well as future gen. Yeah. As no, we're in the current gen now. Yeah. You can call it old old gen. You don't have to call it current. Yeah. The future's now. Did uh, yeah, they say anything about PC? I assume PC development's happening. The last version was pretty oh, good. Oh, yeah. It, you can pre order it on Steam, okay. uh, I pro- probably other stores, but I saw it on Steam. Today okay. As yeah, well. I hadn't seen it on there yet. So, all right. Uh, the demo, uh, there's a demo coming. It will be PlayStation exclusive. Yeah. I heard about that. Uh, different demo in the spring. So that's something to look forward to. And uh, do they see anything about VR? Or no, because seven seven no. really pushed into VR, and I don't know that eight even cares. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I didn't see any confirmation that this would be running on VR, so I would think that maybe that is not going to be the case. It is still first person, so who knows? Yeah. Maybe one day they'll put in that work, but um, as of now, not I so didn't much. See any talk of of VR? Okay, well that's interesting. Uh, anyway, watch for it. Resident Evil making a comeback. It's been here for years. Um, also, RE Verse. What's Verse? I didn't see this. What is this? So oh! this is a weird Resident Evil multiplayer thing. That's right. And you can be, oh shit. You can be like, it's Chris Redfield <laughs> versus Barry or whatever kind of stuff, right? Uh-huh. Oh. Yeah. I don't know. It's got a weird art style. Like it's clearly the same engine that these other games have run on because it's the same models and all of that is like new leon and new player mixed in um but at the same time then it's got like this weird comic book filter applied over the top of it to be a little more bombastic i have no idea what it is it seems to be some sort of pack in to some degree uh Mm. with this new resident evil village and it looks extremely odd it's very weird to watch them all run around with uh, big explosive guns and shoot each other. Do you feel uh, third person or first person? I assume third. Right. It looks third person, yeah. but they didn't. They didn't show much of it at the time. Do you? Uh, so where does that land for you? Are you like, oh yeah, man, day one, me and me and Chris Redfield taking on Jill Valentine. Let's go. I have zero interest. In this, <laughs> honestly, it's not what I. It's not what I come to the game for. You know, I, I think it's proper place as a pack-in as a bonus extra you know it's like mortal cart combat that they did Mm -hmm. uh you know that's a great thing to put in your mortal combat game probably doesn't need to be its own release all all together so uh, although actually that's a weird choice because i actually would really like a mortal combat car combat oh dude in a heartbeat i would ride i would play that i'd play that with most most games if they made a cart version of their game like the last of us part two make a cart game like i'll play whatever i love a good cart game and i love when they're applied to really weird properties so resident evil would make a yeah, great cart combat game. it would you'd have nemesis riding around on something you'd <laughs> have <Wars>. um well <laughs> what a stupid idea it's so stupid but I'd play the hell out of that. I would love that. Yeah. Yeah. You get the really rocket good. launcher. That's kind of your ultimate weapon and, uh, you know, handguns. What if you walk around every time you walk into a hallway in a corridor and Jill and Barry are facing off, you hear Jill, Barry, every time they run into each other. Perfect. And then they, if she lives, for their audience. if she lives and she's on Barry's team, he says, you were almost a Jill sandwich. See, when she Jill escapes. Sandwich. <laughs> oh, God. I, I almost couldn't finish a joke. It was so funny. John. <laughs> I think that would be great. I mean, one of you, one of the power ups could be you drop a wall and smash somebody. And yeah. then old Barry's in his car. <laughs> oh, he made you a chill sandwich. <laughs> and he goes by. It'd be so good. Yeah, I'm kind of with you here. I think tonight's title is going to be Resident Evil Cart. <laughs> I just think you could just fling zombies at the other cart to slow them down. They just got zombies mm-hmm. hanging off the back of the cart, just slowing it. Yeah, it's like squishy yeah. zombies that make you spin out. Uh, that grandma could be in her wheelchair from seven. There's a lot you uh-huh. could do. There's a lot <laughs> you could do. Around. Yep. 
Yeah. Oh man, can you imagine if like Mr. X instead of just a cart racer, he was like an obstacle? You're just driving, and then all of a sudden he just comes around the corner, punches the cart, and it just goes flying. Well, he's like that he's chain. So good. What's the chain thing in Mario? The um, big. Uh, he's like a chained ball with the teeth. Roar, roar. The chain chomp. Chain chomp. You. That's just Mr. X, but he's chained, and and he you know lurches out at you to try to grab you. This is this is like almost a one to one. You could do all the Mario shit, but just do it with like gory. RE7 stuff and like the squid ink that makes it hard to see just make that like a a, a a freaking zombie body that got thrown in the air and just smacks onto your windshield and leaves a bunch of bloody mess and there's so much you could do yeah, yeah I'm on. I honestly I I think it's a super cool idea that is currently my favorite game to play with the kids is on the the little like google play thing i put on the mr x is chasing you music from resident evil 2 i just go stomping after the kids and they run and then they get tired and they don't bug me late at night no, that's perfect great. that's perfect that doesn't leave any kind of mark or a scar or anything they'll they'll be fine they no don't worry about no. it well they uh, don't know what it's based on yet right no. now it's just dopey old me chasing them that's fine there you i go. think if they ever associated it with what it was associated with then then they'd be upset. Now, what's this deal with Resident Evil items being in the Division 2, and why does Ubisoft have anything to do with this? Because that seems crazy to me. Ubisoft apparently is like, hey, what? If, hey, guys, we like Resident Evil. What if we put it in our game? And they were like, I don't know. Sure. That's so weird. now you can be a Division character dressed up like uh, Leon S. Kennedy. Oh, and it's third person behind the back, gun aimed. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Maybe, did we finally find a window into... <laughs> Division two for John, where he'll be happy to shoot guys with extra armor and dogs or whatever it is. Nope. They got to make them look <laughs> like zombies. They got to make them look and act like zombies. Uh, the chat, uh, if, or sorry, we got a couple emails about this because a lot of people were like quick to take you to task on this and say, John just doesn't know it, but there are sub bosses and bosses and other characters in that game that are not just people and dogs. There are like, uh, uh, what did they say? I forgot now. Like okay, some... so I saw one of these comments, yeah. and first of all, I said it's always people, dogs, and drones. I said drones because I had somebody call me out and say, there's drones in that game. I know. <laughs> I said I hate fighting drones. <laughs> I hate fighting drones more than I hate fighting people yeah. because it's always the same. They hover there and go, and yeah. you shoot them, and it just goes plink, 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 and then eventually it blows up for no good reason. Right. It's like a contra boss without the satisfying red glowy bit. Like that's how fighting a drone feels in video games. I hate it. I tend to, um, I, as much as, as much as I'm, um, I'm probably more okay with it than you are. I tend to agree with that. I think that's fair. Drones and they are, said there were cheap. traps. Okay. Yeah. Well, you're not fighting a trap. Traps just happen. You can put traps in any game. Yeah, that's true. You're not wrong. I totally agree with that. I, I'm not faulting anybody who likes this, by the way. I'm just saying it's not a way to get me on the side of your game. If you're like, well, you'll be fighting yeah. uh, militarized people. If John, if you're trying to drones. convince John to play Destiny 2, none of these arguments are going to do it. It's just not. And I like Destiny 2 a <laughs> no, lot. No, Destiny 2 is Or fine. not Destiny 2, sorry. Aliens. Division 2, Division 2. <laughs> it's got aliens and monsters and swords. Yeah. And it also has drones, but they have the cool, weak eye spot right that when i shoot the numbers turn yellow and red to show that i'm doing a good job yeah well i mean division two has that has the numbers as well and weak spots and things but i get your meaning you don't want to yeah. play in uh, uh tom clancy's boring military world you want to play in a book he never wrote about zombies and aliens and giant weapons like you, you just... i don't want to fight a guy that looks like his superpower is he went to a mattress firm <laughs> and stuck it to himself and that's why i have to shoot him 952 times <laughs> a mattress firm we have those too here we have mattress firms that's very funny i have one up right up the road now i'm going to think of that every time i drive past it is that's like a destiny 2 character's favorite place to shop yep. he's going to be a boss and he's going to fight harder because he's got a mattress strapped to him i mean you're not wrong Invincible. you're not wrong um I don't know that game. That game paints itself into a bit of a corner it can't get out of. But for those who really like that, it's very good at that. It's very good at being a more serious take on a looter shooter 
and I think it has its all of its merits. But if you want something that's more genre genre specific or whatever, you're not going to get it there. I'm afraid. All right, uh, what else? Uh, that's a cool thing. Oh, John, we have a new segment. Hold on, I want to play. Uh, we're going to play this uh, theme for this, okay? Because I'm just now thinking of this as a theme. Uh, hold on, okay. we're going to do. Um, uh, uh, let's try this one. I'm grave digger. No, that's not you at all. <laughs> oh, I found one. Here we go. We really pulled a boner on this one. All right, there you go. John, tell me how we've pulled a boner. What's it says here? What it says here is new segment, John's news that isn't news. Take it away. All right. So last week there was uh, not a lot of news going on because yeah. GameStop hadn't happened and Microsoft hadn't decided to announce and then unannounce something. Right. So <laughs> Back in those days, the biggest news story I could find was that Naughty Dog had supposedly announced uh, through the form of some art from one of their, their concept artists that they were working on a new project that was going to be a fantasy type video game. So stepping away from your Nathan Drakes and your Last of Us and go into kind of a fantasy D&D style world. Uh, but it turns out it's not true. Uh oh, you just. They were doing some Valhalla art, fan art, Damn it. and it is not what they're working on. So this is news that isn't news. Naughty Dog is not making a fantasy game. At least it hasn't been confirmed yet. Although I do want to say, and this is why I did put it in there, how cool would it be if Naughty Dog made a fantasy game? Oh my gosh, I'd be so into this. I'd be so into this. I don't even know what it would be like. No, a hundred percent. Like I'm just trying I'm, right now. I, what I can picture is incredible performance, facial acting capturing that they're so known for in a fantasy universe with a really, a really strong bent on story. Oh my gosh, dude, we could use this. You know what would get me out to buy a PS5 tomorrow? That game. You want you want me to care about PS5 this generation? You make that game, Naughty Dog, because you'll probably put it only there, and I will buy it for that. That is that is why I will get a PS5 right there. Oh, man, that's a great idea. Gosh, dang it. Also, I don't know if I buy this. I'm looking at this art. Here, chat. I'm going to share this out to you here. Um, it doesn't seem very Valhalla-y. No, she say. looks a little like what's-her-name, but the, the there's no dragons in Valhalla. There's no dragons in there. Well, yeah, she killed it. <laughs> yeah, I guess she killed it. <laughs> but I don't know. That sword looks more like something the Witcher would keep around. Something about this does not you scream to me. Well, I don't know if I believe them. I think I may. I think I may think they're lying. It was fan art inspired by and made while the artist played Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Now, I guess that doesn't necessarily say. It is Valhalla. It was they were playing Valhalla and went, I want to draw some fantasy stuff. Yeah. But uh, it could be a cover. This could be what they're actually doing. If yep. we want to get out our tinfoil hats, we could pretend. Because yep. I think a fantasy Naughty Dog game would be amazing. I do think it's time for them to go uh, and reinvent themselves a little bit. They've told their story in Uncharted. They've told their story in Last of Us. You know, they they've told their Jack and Dexter story. Yeah, they, <laughs> we can they, we can move They've told that forward. horrible three D O fighting game story. We've heard that. Mm -hmm. So, one hundred percent, dude. Freaking sign me up for whatever the hell this would be, which right now is nothing. But, uh, oh man, seriously, don't get me this excited. I'm so excited for an idea like that. I just want to see whatever they whatever they do next. Next feels like it's got to be different. In a, in a big way from the other two games. Because the other two games, while not the same or even remotely similar thematically, they were still behind the back, shooter mechanics. Um, go, I found some loot. I'm going to go open it and see what happens. And I'm going to talk to these characters. And then this will all be impeccably voice acted and, and performance captured. And then, you know, graphically, it'll be amazing and all of that. Like, those games share that DNA. Move that into another genre entirely like a full-blown rpg with like you know stats and loot and all that oh my gosh you're talking my Do you language. feel like they're locked in as a company to graphic show pieces now <sighs> like do you think they could come out and i'm not saying it's a good idea to do another jack and daxter but do you think they could make a game like jack and daxter now um yeah but they would if they did they would probably be like it's it's like a budget title it's a little side thing we worked on. You know, like that thing, the thing that like Hello Games worked on while they've been 
still putting out new content for No Man's Sky. I forgot what it was called. Like Campfire or something like that, whatever it was. Yeah. Small little adventure game. Something like that. I could see them doing something like that, and then the, and the PR spin on it would be just that. Like, hey, look what we did with 20% of our time. We made a fun little side thing that's whatever. But I do think they're in a, they're, they have painted themselves into a, a place where that's the games they make now. I don't know how else they do anything else. Like, the expectations are just too high for them. You know what I mean? Can you picture yeah. it like a Jack and Daxter game? I don't think I could at this stage. I, I, I think that if they did it, it would have to be... Like, it would have to be astonishing looking. Like, they would have to go... It would have to be graphically extremely impressive. Yeah. But I think they could probably step away from photorealism if they wanted to go that route. But I think it would still have to be a real showpiece or, like you said, something smaller scale. Mm -hmm. Yep, I think I agree. Well, on that note, what have we been playing? Uh, Hitman, you know the Hitman there. Hitman 3. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, which feels a lot like just Hitman the collection because if you already own Hitman 1 and 2, well, okay, it's a little complicated because on PC, Hitman uh, 1 was a free giveaway a while back. And so if you got it, you just have it, right? And I did. If you buy Hitman 3, Hitman 2, the game Hitman 2 is not yet on the Epic Store. And right now, PC exclusive for Hitman 3, so it's the only place to get it. Um, they do. They basically let you go to Steam or other stuff, or if they haven't yet, they're gonna. I forget the deal because I didn't do this. And yeah, I heard what they I were working on a fix for this because the whole idea is it's supposed to be you launch Hitman Three, and if you own all the games, you just have to play Hitman Three. Right. You can play Hitman Three, but also all the other games content is there. All the other levels, all the uh, bonus objectives and this you know special assassination modes and just the the entire campaigns of those other two games they're all in there if you own the previous two games they just load up in there um you can choose to do whatever you want that's really a value add i think and very cool that they're doing it and they have promised no matter what no matter who owns it where they will make this possible for whoever they've just had to kind of work around some technical issues um i didn't want to wait which is kind of dumb because it's it's not like I'm going to play the old stuff quite yet anyway, so I don't know why I got impatient. But they also, uh, I think, did a nice thing and made the Hitman 2 uh, pass, basically. The thing that lets all the Hitman 2 stuff unlock, uh, they sold for like 7 bucks, And so I did that because who cares? It's 7 bucks, It's fine. So I spent the extra 7 bucks. I have them all now because I already had one. The 7 bucks got me two, and now I'm playing three. And I will say this. After this trilogy is now complete, I'm pretty sure IO Interactive might be one of my one of the developers I want to keep my eye on the most moving forward. I know they've got those Bond games coming up, which makes perfect sense to have these guys involved in that. Although I don't know what those even look like. You know, Agent Forty Seven is doing very different stuff than James Bond would do. But um, yeah. but the 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 concept of them working on a Bond game is very exciting to me. But what I like about them. And what I like about this trilogy is it delivered everything they ever promised with it. And then some, it was never, there was never any sort of pie in the sky. Oh my gosh. I, this will be the next generation of stealth forever moment where they then didn't deliver on what they promised. They delivered everything along the way from game one, all the way up through this third one. And even this behind the scenes, trying to make it so everybody who owns this game can play it with all three games there like that shows that says a lot to me about about who they are and they just nailed the landing i'm not that far i think i'm four missions in to to the main campaign the story campaign um i'm already blown away by this thing the the german uh dance club set or place is just insane it is so cool so freaking cool Those games are really incredible i loaded them up uh this actually on christmas i think just to play the uh it was one of those games that did a holiday theme uh for the original hitman release where you were doing the first map yeah. the big photo shoot uh but it was all decorated for christmas and there were christmas objectives and santa claus was teleporting all over the place yeah. and there's some about it i just associate it with with christmas for me i was like i want to play this for the holidays i uh, went in there I knocked Santa out by throwing something like a can of beans at his head. 
game is really fun and really funny and uh i i love it i yeah. think the hitman games you know it was when the first one came out it really kind of caught everybody off guard because not a lot of people had played the previous ones and now with two and three i feel like it gets talked about less because like you said they just are so good at executing on it yeah. that it doesn't draw headlines it's like oh well the game was really fun and great and guess what it's still really fun and great yeah um but i can't i can't wait to play it i'm kind of in the same boat where i'm like should i wait for steam mm -hmm. should i wait till they figure all this stuff out but i i definitely want it i had the same feeling and i wasn't sure what to do i ended up doing it because i just i don't know i felt like i just needed to play it and um knowing that they've been uh you know that they're as cool as they are about making sure you're going to be able to get that stuff kind of sold me i was like well i don't need to wait because i don't care where i'm launching this i just want to play it and uh I haven't had any bugs, no glitches. It runs amazing on this 3080 I got. It looks incredible, actually. And the the engine improvements on 3 are retroactive. So, um, you know, any kind of, like, improved color stuff, texture stuff, all that stuff is applied to 2 and 1 as well in that scenario. Um, it's just such a fun... Oh, and there's, like, you know, the, <clears throat> the user-generated missions are very cool. You just go do these crazy. Some of them are crazy. One of them was ridiculous. It was like, go kill this lady. That's all it said to me. Just go kill this lady. And there's a bunch of secondary injectors, but I haven't looked at it yet. And I'm thinking, oh, this is in like Chinatown. She's way in there. So I don't know where she is. This is gonna be a this is gonna be trouble. I don't know how to find her. The mission starts. I walk five feet. There's a lady looking over a bridge in the rain, just looking down. It's freaking her. <laughs> so I killed her and I got the thing. Then there were like 10 secondary objectives it was actually hard and I went and I can go do those. But the main one, I just knocked her out. So there's like fun, like goofy, uh, you know, uh, created stuff by the community. They feature a bunch of that. So they're fun to just mess around in. Um, the sniper thing is back. Going to all those old, uh, those old maps and, and taking your unlocks through those, those areas is all possible. It's just a very, very complete rad package. But in, in threes, so, so to sort of praise three a little bit, um, three looks the best of all three, but I also think the environmentally three is mind blowing. <laughs> like there are, there are, there's some, uh, there's like, there's basically a mini, um, knives out scenario in this thing, the movie knives out and the mansion that you're in this British mansion you're in with this fa family, it's all in fighting, trying to find who committed a murder. Uh, while you're <laughs> you're pretending to be someone you murdered. <laughs> anyway, uh, it is some of the most detailed environment stuff I've ever seen. This place, I can almost smell the old leather and wood. It's just incredible in there. So anyway, it's really rad. And I think IO Interactive is, is, uh, deserves just a ton of credit for not only doing exactly what they promised and putting it out there, and there was news today that the first week of sales for three paid for all their development costs for three, which is what you want out of a game. So it just makes me happy that they're getting, you know, on the back end, it's working out for them. But um, I just, I think we should celebrate companies who, and developers in particular, who know what they want to do and they do it really pristinely. Not only that, they took what I think was a franchise that everyone thought was done. No one was, no one was clamoring for more Hitman. The old Hitman games yeah. were, you know, kind of soured everybody out. We're like, okay, freaking... Here's another Hitman game. And they were, you know, they were good hit, Hitman games for sure, but they were petering out. And these guys swooped in and said, what if we kind of reinvented it? What if we sandboxed the shit out of this, but still figured out a way to make an amazing story wind through the whole thing? And they did it. And it's so good. So fat hat off my fat head. I can't because my headphones are on to that game and those guys who made it. I think it's awesome. It's my favorite game of 2021 so far. I'll put it that way. Ooh. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, played I some good we're games. Only a month in, but that's. High I mean, it, look, if Shipbreaker comes out of early access, then all bets are off. But right now, it's still early access. I can't count it. As soon as that thing's in full release, it's probably my year, <laughs> game of the year. But, but Hitman is just rad. Uh, speaking of Shipbreaker, played a ton more of that. I got a quick story to tell you. I told this on TMS, so I apologize for those who are hearing this twice. But John needs to hear how this went. So I'm in Shipbreaker, and. I only had a I only had a little time before I had to go visit my mom. And so I was like, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna bang out one of these small little frigate ships 
because I've unlocked like the big, big, huge freighter stuff. I'm in like these yeah. monstrous cavernous ships and they have their own level of fun and challenge and everything else, but they take a while to do, which isn't a problem, except I just didn't have the time. So instead of saving or, you know, uh, going back to the pod and starting a new shift, I thought, well, let's do a small ship, get this over with, get all the cash for it and get out and then I'll run off to the hospital. So I did that. And uh, <clears throat> got a ship, and I was like, all right, it's medium difficulty, no big deal. It's like class two or three, whatever those are. Uh, I go inside, uh, airlock, stuff floating around in there, turn all that off, so now I can just open it. We don't have a problem with the compression or anything. I'm remembering all the things you should do, go turn off the gas on this side. Uh, if you have a key, turn off the console so that your thruster doesn't explode. Uh, make sure there's no static electricity near the freaking there. All these things that you do when you go into this thing. I did all of that like you're supposed to do all that stuff. And then on the right side of the ship, I forgot to turn off the fuel tanks. <laughs> and I'm not even sure this would have helped. I think it just made it a worse explosion because I still I hit one of the tanks and they explode no matter what. But I think because they were piped in and running, it made for a worse explosion. Now, the explosion didn't kill me. And it also didn't do enough to the ship to destroy my chances of salvaging a bunch of it. It was a minor kind of back quarter panel blowout. But it was just enough of a blowout that it created some perpetual motion. And as we all know, in space physics, you don't stop that so easily. It's when it's a big, heavy object. It starts moving. Yep. It moves, right? So this ship goes, and just kind of gets knocked out of its like floating space there and starts arcing and turning. And I'm in it. And I'm like, oh, shit. And I'm down. My health's down. So I get out of the back end where I blew it out and I notice, oh, no, this is bad. My ship is floating and, and going toward the big red fiery incinerator on the other side where that means the entirety of my ship will get burned. I lose all that money on stuff I could have. I mean, it's just a complete blowout of my work order. There's no good that comes from this. So I panic. I'm like, all right, I got 25 tethers. What if I start tethering this thing to this wall? So I'm shink, bonk, shink, bonk, shink, just connecting all these tethers. I got like 12 tethers going. It's still not strong enough. It's pulling tethers apart. It's slowed a little bit, still going, moving toward the incinerator. It starts to rotate, I think, because the, I think the, the tethers made it kind of go a little with some motion. It starts to rotate and ends up getting caught in the gravity well of the incinerator. And once that happens, you're just hosed. And it pulls in, but then doesn't go into the hole because the top of the ship and the bottom of the ship are now bonk, jammed on the on the rims. <laughs> it's too big for the entryway. Yes. If it was laying flat, like, a you know, imagine the, the Enterprise on its side and just jammed uh -huh. up against the hole instead of flying through the hole. It's like that. So it's sitting there, banged against it. And I just sat there going, what the frick am I going to do? I think, can I save this? So my brain was like, all right, tether this maybe. Uh, what if I cut off some of it, took the nacelles off, and then maybe it would be light enough for me to pull it out of there with tethers. So I started cutting the cells off, and as soon as I cut one off, floop, went right into the incinerator. The, the nacelle did and burned, and it was worthless. I'm like, well, that's not going to work, but maybe it'll still be lighter. So then I cut the other one. It got sucked into the butthole, and then I tried to tether. Still too strong, kind of budging, but not enough. Now I'm on top of it, and I'm getting pulled toward it. The only way I'm going to get out of here is if I tether myself and pull my, my, my pulley over there. So I'm ready to do that. The way I decide to get around this is I put a depth charge. They have these new charges. They're like mines. And you have to unlock them uh, after a couple of ranks. But anyway, I put them on a couple of key points on the structure of this thing and decide to cut it in half. Uh, or not half, but like the lower third, I guess. I was going to try to cut off. And I'm like, all right, if I can get that lower third off, then maybe these tethers will hold the top. And then I can save the top, computers, chairs, storage, some things that I can get money for that are also on my work order because you got like a quest list. And so I do this and it goes, pa pa, and then just sucks the bottom chunk in, floop, turns the top, sucks the top in and the thing's going bear, 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 and the lady's going this is not the proper thing please revisit your training this is not the proper thing she kept saying the shit in my ear but i'm still in the gravity well and i'm aiming trying to go oh shit i'm trying to shoot my thing to snag and then pull myself i never could do it 
I got pulled into the incinerator. So the entire no. thing, I'm dead. The ship is gone in one fell swoop. It's all just eaten in one bite. All that money down the drain. You don't lose that much, but it's, you know, it's like six, $6 million worth of cash I didn't get toward my debt. And, uh, and that was it. And now you might be saying, well, Scott, that almost sounds like a bug. What a terrible experience you had. That was some of the most fun, creative, yeah. interesting, like intense gaming I've played in a while. I loved it. And normally this is a very Zen game for me. It's chill. And you know, I'm not, I don't do it with the timer mode on because those timers bug me. So I'm playing the the non-timer mode in the campaign. And it just means I can do it at will and move stuff around. And it's just great. And it's very calming to me. But this was like full-blown emergency, like five alarm, five alarm fire. And I cannot say enough about how much fun I was having. Well, it sounds like a very, you know, the game is going for that, like you're a blue-collar worker in a sci-fi universe sort of feel. Mm -hmm. And it feels like that kind of problem. Like this is, this is the kind of problem you're going to have on that job. Like this is the most disastrous that job can go. You know, this is going to go up on the fail videos of whatever space YouTube is at this point. And it's going to be like, look at this ship breaker. He really screwed up. Yep. Uh, I don't know. It's maybe a mercy that your guy got pulled in. Can, <laughs> can you imagine? Like if that was your job, yeah. your job is to break down ships and you accidentally incinerated an entire ship yeah. by mistake. That's not a fun conversation when you come back inside. I mean, I got most of the aluminum money because those do get incinerated. So there's things you do want to throw in the incinerator because those particular metals need to be thrown there to be broken down. And so I got some money for that. Whatever it could find in the ship. But everything got burned, all of it. So my computer, I needed like six computer consoles to get a certain work order level down in the green net thing. And I didn't get one. <laughs> They're all incinerated. So yeah, there's like a fun feeling of like, oh, my boss is going to be pissed at me. I already owe the company $980 billion or whatever it is to even get this job to go up there. Rumors about this game being set in the Homeworld universe does nothing but intrigue me. Like... I love it. I just love it. And it's, yes, it's an early access, but man, there's a lot there to do. Like it's, it doesn't feel like a game that's missing a ton of stuff. And they just added those big cruiser ships to it. Um, and they take a while to do, but they're really fun and challenging. And man, I just can't say enough about it. So if you haven't well, tried I told it, you uh, in the pre-show, I've installed it. I've gotten in. I kind of stopped in the middle of the tutorial uh, cause things just got chaotic, but I really liked what I saw so far and I'm going to, I'm going to stick with it for sure. Yeah. It's cool. You got to get some, um, I'm, I'm actually really cool, how, cool or curious how you do with the controller because when I started playing it, it was keyboard only. Now the controller supports there and there've been people on YouTube and other places I've seen who rave about the controller support and say it's the way to play the game. Um, but I have not, I just haven't tried it yet. So. It's part of the reason I quit is when I realized I could play it with the controller, I picked it up and it already felt good, but I had missed now half of the tutorial right. where it was going to be telling me what buttons do what. And I thought, oh, I got to restart this. So. Yeah. I did, here are the, so if you're at home and you're like, oh, I finally bit the bullet and bought the game, Scott, what's your, what are your tips? Here are my things I would say. Learn how to use your, uh, your tethers. Tethers are key and also really fun. And some ridiculous emergent gameplay happens with tethers. Tethers are great. They're physics toys, but they also get the job done. They're amazing. Uh, so there's tethering. And by the way, it, watching the intro uh, cinematic trailer for this thing features a bunch of tether work, and you'll get the idea of why tethers matter. <laughs> They're just awesome. And yeah. once you start getting to use those a lot, um, it's great. And don't don't worry about using too many because even though it's like five grand to get a new set of 25 tethers, it's no big deal. You just fly up to the little pod. If you ran out, buy another set and you're full again and go use them all. Like it's just, it's a, it's a worthy thing to keep spending money on in the game. Um, what else? Uh, so tethers are really important. Learn how to use those mines properly. Um, there's some ships early on that have like a green rut thing that holds parts of the ship together that you can't laser. That's what you'll want those mines for eventually. So you'll be able to salvage even more of the ships later down the road when you unlock that. Um, what else? Oh, if you can focus on the work or on the work orders, which you bring up with the tab key if you're on keyboard and it basically is just a list. It's like a quest list. It's like, well, we need so many tons of steel and we need 
four computer components and we need a flight recorder. You know, it's like just a list of stuff you got to accomplish. And you can stick around and like salvage the entire ship. That's not a problem. And that's more money in your pocket for sure. But if, but if you really want to just crank through it and give them what they're asking for, you can go do those lists, complete the work order, and then whatever's left, just tether into the freaking incinerator on purpose and just burn it. <laughs> it's just great. Oh, my gosh. It's good. Yeah. Uh, also, um, I came this close to buying that Knight's Tale thing. Uh, the King Arthur deal. Uh, XCOM-like uh, magic medieval business. And... Uh, I came really close to picking it up. That game looks really, really cool. Uh, what I'm reading, though, from everybody who's either played it or early access reviews, is that it is it is one of those early access games, kind of like uh, Kyle brought up Gloomhaven, and he's right. It's like it's like that where it's very limited in terms of the actual total content available yet. What's there is very awesome, but there's way more coming, like actual you know, levels and story and characterization and all the stuff's just not in there yet. So that's what I'm going to hold off on. I almost did it because I'm hearing just amazing things about it. XCOM meets, you know, proper freaking uh, fantasy setting. And that's exciting to me. So something I'm going to keep my eye on. But as a result, I ended up playing a bunch of XCOM likes again because I always end up playing those here and there. And I played one I, I think I'm going to recommend. Um, I talked about it on the Boop Show as well because it kind of fits in the indie category. But it's a game called Fort Triumph. Okay? Hmm. So imagine yeah. a, a fort, right, where you triumph a lot. <laughs> Not really. Uh-huh. Uh, basically, it's XCOM in the, in the gameplay. And then the overworld and some of that stuff is uh, Heroes of Might and Magic. It's those okay. two genres mushed. So above the world, it's all very cartoony and goofy. Um, that's the other thing. The style is definitely meant to be a little more lighthearted. But on the overworld, you're running around getting treasure and loot and picking fights and and auto winning some of them because they're way under you. But then some are equal to you and some are way too hard. So you shouldn't fight them yet. Uh, you have a fort back there that you build over time. And, and there's like a day night cycle. So as days go by, uh, construction is finished on a building that gives you more health while you're in battles or Whatever. Think of it as the XCOM base stuff. It's like that. And then um, when you do actual fights, story or otherwise, it puts you in XCOM setting where you're uh, you got like a tank and you got like a a healer and a, a you know archer and like all the archetypes that are in your fantasy games are all there and they all have their different abilities and stuff and that stuff plays out exactly like XCOM does, turn based, same kind of stuff, percentage percentage hit chance that kind of stuff um the one big uh addition here is that there's a bunch of physics in the world so if there is a creature behind a tree and i can see that tree and aim properly with like uh whatever power i have like a magic person can send like a tornado over there a little mini tornado it'll knock the tree over and either hurt or kill the creature behind it uh there's rocks that you can like the, the big tank guy can kick really hard and it'll fly across the battlefield and, and hurt whatever it is you're trying to hit. A um, bunch of things like that. So a lot of interactivity in the world itself. I ended up really having fun with it. My favorite part is the XCOM-like part. My least favorite part is the Heroes of Might and Magic part, but that's only because that was never a thing. I just never really glommed on to the, to the HOMM model. So it's not really my 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 favorite part of it, but I think as a whole it works pretty well, and I think the combat's really good, and it's like under thirty bucks, so it's probably a good pick for some people. Guy recommended. What is it, to it me on? I, liked it. Uh, I, PC. I didn't see it on Steam. Let's see, Steam. Is it not Steam. Uh, hold on, I had a list here. Steam, and it's co- oh, it's coming to Switch and consoles, but not yet. It's only on Steam so far. Okay. So. Uh, yeah, and, uh, the Cliffy Show in the chat says, Did, "Have we ever played Mutant uh, Year Zero, uh, Road to Eden?" Yes, I love that. That's a very cool game. That's that's one that took me a while to glom onto because I didn't like the giant ducks and stuff and pigs. I was like, "Wait a minute, what are we even doing here?" But actually, that game's really cool. But it's like that. It's one of those. And so, if that sounds like your jam, you might find some happiness in a game like Fort Triumph. Personally, well, I'm gonna be yeah. I'm gonna be looking into stuff like that because I. Could be wrong. This is my first kid. I have zero experience in this regard. But in anticipating a bunch of uh, late nights where I need to get up and 
have to do, uh, you know, have to tend to baby and stuff like that, where I might have a real inconsistent sleep schedule. I am thinking that uh, my gaming experience is going to go very heavily turn-based. Things that I can, at a moment's notice, drop and walk away from and leave running and play a little here and there when I can. So I'm thinking Civilization mm-hmm. and, you know, maybe XCOM and stuff like that are going to become... I totally my agree. Twos during that period of time. The bane of my existence in 1998 when I had a little baby girl was uh, RTSs were the thing, right? Like StarCraft or yeah, StarCraft was out that year. Brood War was out that year. It's all anybody wanted to play. And I found it just horrible because if you're playing multiplayer, you can't pause it. Or you could, but it would piss off everybody <laughs> and they could unpause <laughs> yeah. it. I don't know if you remember that. It was so stupid. I do. It was really annoying. Uh, or if you're playing single player, you could pause, but there you you're taken out of the rhythm, and then what were you even doing, right? But games like this are so much better for that. I actually think that's a great idea, is to is to play a turn based game while you're kind of you know feeding a baby at midnight or or whatever, because you can kind of pick up and leave, and everything stays, and nobody's you know nobody's in a rush. Plus, I'm just loving, I'm loving that kind of game right now. I don't know what my deal is. Yeah. Just hungry for it. It just feels good. I actually, it's not on my list. It's another one that I barely got into, not enough to talk about, but I loaded up Desperados 3 because it's on Game Pass. Oh, it was yeah. one I almost bought during the Steam sale mm-hmm. on your recommendation. Yep. And I got into the tutorial, and I was in the middle of that. Again, life happened, and I ended up quitting out of it because I couldn't focus on it anymore. Right. But I, I was in the same boat where I was like, man, I just wish this was... Mm-hmm. I wish this was turn based. I know yeah. you can pause it. Yeah. I was like, I wish that I could just issue a command and have a turn where I might be getting really deep into this. As a result, the kind of real time nature of it um, prevented me from going back to it yeah. already. So. Yeah, it's that game's amazing, but there are times where I wish that too. I mean, they are they are really paying homage to the Commandos games, and then their even their other game, that uh, Shogun game. What was that called? whatever it's called the one right before this anyway um that's the games they make but their part of me was like oh i wish you guys just you know let me have action points and like let me just do that <laughs> thing because i do i love a turn-based game and if you'd ask me in the 90s hey scott want to play a turn-based game i'd say f right off not interested though that's for people who suck that's for chess players go away like i would have been a real ass about it honestly because i thought i was too cool for school. It's real time now, baby. That's the internet now. We know what we're doing. It's real time. But now, total flip. I don't want, I don't like, I don't want to play any art of real time games. I want to play, I mean, I do. It's not true, but I don't, I want, if you're saying to me, hey, I got an army, you got an army, we got to fight. How do you want to do it? By taking effing turns. Yeah. By really taking my time to think about it. Yeah. That's how. That's exactly how. Do you know if uh, Desperados 3 is on console? Uh, uh, I played it on PC, but I think it might be both. See, I'd I feel be tempted like to, mm. I remember it being both. My biggest complaint about Game Pass is a problem that actually is one of the things that makes it good, which is it has great cloud interoperability between the console and PC, so your saves and all that stuff's really simple. But it makes it so if you have a save for the same game on Steam, I can't move that over. Because even though it's a local save, Game yeah. Pass saves are all cloud-based saves. Like entirely, I think. I don't know. I got to look into that. Because I'm pretty far in that game, and I would I would probably want to move that over if I played it on a That's couch. That's the thing that, that I feel like if they want to really open up game pass and I mean, we already talked about, you know, 18 million is a, is a real good number. But if I think if they want to start putting up numbers uh, that even rival, you know, active users on things like Epic and steam and stuff like that, I think the best bet is to find a way to make it a little more user friendly with the stores and storefronts that yeah. people already use. I agree. If even if that's just allowing imports of save. Like, yeah. you know, even if it's not, 
you know, it's not like the EA thing on Steam where you can have it inside Steam and all of that, even if they don't go that far with it. Just a way to say, I have this game. I want to be able to load up my progress from this into this. If they can find a way to do that, ah, it'd be great. And we know that, I mean, be so good. technically we know that's a po- that's totally possible. It's just a matter of, are they willing to do it? And they're already putting those games on other platforms anyway, so I can go to Steam right now and play Gears 5 or any of the Microsoft titles. They're they're putting them everywhere. The question is, is the rumor true that Steam might carry a Game Pass subscription? They carry an EA Play subscription now, so yeah. is it possible they could integrate Game Pass into Steam so that if you're already a Game Pass player your Steam Microsoft Game Pass games will be just there to play. This just means Valve gets cut, right? Like, I don't know. I think these are all possibilities. just a matter of them. How willing is everyone willing to work with each other? I don't know. Well, okay. So that actually reminds me. You asked why I thought 18 million seemed a little low for Game Pass. I'll give you an example on paper why it seemed low to me. Mm. So Epic just reported that they had 19 million consecutive people uh, on for the Battlefront 2 being given away for free as part of their store. Okay. That that got their numbers up to 19 million. Okay. I was like, that's, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah. Um, but I thought about that, and I was like, that game's free on Game Pass. Has been free on Game Pass if you have it. Right. And to see that number, I mean, I guess, you know, 100% free on a free shop, you don't need to pay anything Mm -hmm. is always going to trump you know i paid 15 dollars a month or 10 dollars a month or whatever it might be but i'm sitting there thinking i'm like man i've had that game for free for months now Mm -hmm. that i could just load it up and play it Mm -hmm. and that number is smaller it just seemed seemed like it should be higher game has such a good deal like again we're not sponsored by them i feel like i need to say it because i rave about it so much yeah they don't pay for this show, but I am always just over the moon with what is on there. I mean, Microsoft finally uh, in January released their first first party exclusive game, uh, that game Medium. Yeah. And you can play it. Yeah. I, I, it's getting kind of positive to middle of the road reviews is what I'm hearing about it. Sure. But. Guess what? I don't have to buy it. I can go play it and judge it for myself. Yep. That's a pretty that's a pretty It's good, a compelling uh, thing. I, I agree. But th- th- here's some perspective for you. Uh in 2020 What month was this? Oh, go go away. Okay. In 2020 April Let's do June cuz it's a little higher. Uh June th- uh Steam peaked at 21.63 million. Now that's okay. con- that's concurrent users. That's on yeah. all at once, and I guarantee you, we're in the three hundred plus million users uh, signed up for Steam, but actually using it concurrently, twenty something million. Um, yeah, that's, that's a seemed, good perspective. That seemed lower than I thought it would be, right? Like, yeah, and if the real Game Pass number is in the twenty fours, that's yeah, it's that's big. Good. It's big, and I. I'm, well, Asia is a hard apple to crack, and if they can never do that, I don't know. I, you know, I don't. I don't know. I don't know what the future of Xbox is in Asia because they just have a really hard time there. Although PlayStation's not doing great there either. Right now, the Switch owns everything in Japan. Japan is like all Switch all the time, all day. Don't know what that says, but it says something. Um, but yeah, it's going to get interesting. I guess is what I'm saying. And also, I I still think it's an important piece of this puzzle to to mention that. Game Pass as a as a concept, it's really been just this year that it either is dawning on people that it's valuable or that they're even hearing about it. Because up till now, it feels like an insular gamer thing. But this is the year where grandma was told, did you know for 15 a month you can get that for that kid and he'll never have to buy another $70 game again. He'll have all these games, hundreds of games. Like that's the first time people are hearing about this thing. So I, I think this will be the year to really watch it. Like 2021 will be the tale. Uh, everything else leading up to this is kind of like, yeah, it's them sort of it being a thing, but mostly gamers who are in the know know about it. It's not really mainstream. But this is the year where they really said, you know what, or 2020 anyway, was the year where this like, yeah, this needs to go 
big. And I'm still not sure that people fully understand it. I had to explain this to my freaking son-in-law as a smart kid, but he's like, no, wait a minute. What? Just for, for, so it's like Netflix, but for, you know, I had, I had to really dig down to have him get what he was getting for it. He struggled. So I think there's some of that in the way. I think it'd be interesting to see what happens if Microsoft can get Game Pass on Switch as like an app for the Switch. Can you imagine that if you had a if you had an Xbox Series X or yeah. S, yeah, and your Switch could through the internet connect to it and just become the game console for yeah. it through the streaming service. Yeah, that'd be pretty crazy. Be that'd be cool. awesome. It'd be amazing. Yeah, it'd be amazing. I mean, they were trying to do that. Microsoft was trying to do that with Nintendo in particular. And I don't know if it's still off the table, but it just didn't, it, nothing gelled yet. But I mean, it's such a better choice than mobile <laughs> for streaming stuff, except, I don't know, controllers are great on mobile now, but also where you put in it, you buy one of those strap-ons and I don't know, that whole thing's messy. I'm more and more like you every day on mobile. It's kind of bumming me out. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's not a good place to live. My opinion on mobile, I understand that every time I come out and I'm like, mobile games, I'm crawling from the sewers and just like, I'm just slimy and gooey and just like, I hate mobile games. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just a big sourpuss to the party. But you know what? Welcome. Yeah, welcome, <laughs> welcome to, the, to this side. Welcome the to the party, pal, is what you'd say. Yeah. Sure. Uh, all right. Speaking of mobile, you've been playing Pokemon Go. <laughs> yeah. So now, having said that I hate mobile games and uh, it's a terrible platform for video games, let me tell you that I have spent uh, way more time on Pokemon Go than any other video game uh, for the past couple weeks. Um, good news is it means I'm going outside and I'm walking. I need it. Uh, but it's been really fun diving back into that game. Um you know, it's not the phenomena that it was. You're not going to a park and seeing just a ton of people standing there. But they've done a really interesting thing to make you. I now live in a world where I'm paranoid that everyone I'm looking at is a Pokemon player. <laughs> I love that. I love it. Everyone's a potential foe or comp competition for, for, for balls and eggs and not eggs. There's no eggs. What am I trying to say? <laughs> there are eggs in there, but yeah. It's, I had a weird interaction. I was out at a park, socially distanced. Yeah. Um, but I was standing there and I was, I was fighting Team Rocket on my, on my phone because they've, they've done a lot more with the battling aspect of that game. You now uh, have more reasons to fight with the Pokemon that you're collecting rather than just look at them and go, look, it's strong. Sure. And as I'm doing this, a, a lady walked by and she goes, are you kicking me off my gym? Oh my and gosh, I, dude. Uh, wow. I went, uh, I said, I couldn't remember who had control of the gym. And I went, no, I don't think I am. Yeah. And she was like, okay. And she walked away. And I was just like, now I believe every person I see at the park is secretly a Pokemon Go player. Yeah. And we're all eyeing each other suspiciously because they got that team thing and you get the tribalism. Now she and I were actually on the same team is what I found out. Oh. So that's fine. All right. But uh, it, it's I was like, I was shocked. What and if you had said, now, well, yes, I am kicking you out of your gym. What would what do you think would have happened there? I don't know. Maybe she would have charged me. Fisticuffs, you know? man. She, Fisticuffs. Yeah. yeah. She's like we're going to throw down. That's intense. I I don't know. I it would go back to that Werner Herzog quote <laughs> about Pokemon Go that yeah. I love so much. Yeah. Uh, it's my favorite thing he's ever said besides I want to see the baby. Uh <laughs> Yeah. Um, but he, him asking if what happens when they meet, is there violence? Is there blood? Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe there would have been. It's really good though. My wife is hooked on it now too. So I've got a partner in crime everywhere I go. I've drug her into this mess. And, uh, you know, I'm an old school Pokemon fan. Mm -hmm. I like the original red and blue because that's where I started. And they're doing a whole event in February, right before my son is born, actually where you're going to be able to get all of the original 151. So I'm gearing up for that. Interest might fall off after that, especially as the baby kind of takes over. But sure. it's a way to kind of gamify getting out and and being out of the house and doing other things. And it's been, it's been really, really nice to do. They've put in enough quality of life things to where I'm not having to put myself at risk because of COVID and things like that. 
um, but I can still get out and have a good time. So, well, let me read you my favorite Werner Herzog quote. Are you ready for this? Okay. Yes. A uh, little food for thought here. Uh, this is him. A long time ago he said this, but here's what he said. Look into the eyes of a chicken and you will see real stupidity. It is a kind of bottomless stupidity, a fiendish stupidity. They are the most horrifying, cannibalistic, and nightmarish creatures in the world, unquote. It's pretty good. It's so good. <laughs> Everything he says is so good. I agree. He's the man. Um, He's the man. He's so great. His his movies are also very good. His documentaries are very very good. Like this guy's a talented dude. His acting's great, but he says some great shit. Here I found the Pokemon quote. Okay. This is it. All right. When two persons in search of a Pokemon clash at the corner of Sunset and San Vicente, is there violence? <laughs> is there murder? You might be able to catch some. It's all completely virtual. It's very simple but it's also an overlay of physical-based information that now exists on top of the real world. They do fight virtually. <laughs> what a weird quote. That's a very weird quote. Here's another weird one. Do you not hear... Sorry. Do you not then hear this horrible scream all around you that people usually call silence? I, <laughs> I hear it. <laughs> It's so good, dude. All right. Werner Herzog, a new segment on the show. We'll read his quotes each week. Check in every time we do it. Oh, Spirit Fair. I played this. You play uh this is a great game. I love this game. Are you playing it on Game Pass or somewhere else? I'm playing it on Game Pass. This game is a hundred percent my type of game. I yeah. think you said that back when you talked about it before. Yeah. Oh my god, I love Spirit Fair. It's I'm not so very cool. far in it, but this is so my jam. It's it's dumb. It's got a <laughs> sweet dumb. boat. Yep. Uh, you go from place to place. Uh, it's very chill. There's a building component. Yep. Um, so the the general gist of it, in case people didn't hear you talk about it, I'll talk about it just a little bit, is that you are taking over for Charon as the new uh, spirit fairer. You're going to take people to the realm of the dead. And you do so on a much better boat than what Charon had. Um, so you uh, you basically build it up. It looks like a big old houseboat. You can expand it. You put a bunch of amenities on the boat so that you can have like a kitchen to cook for people. And you can have rooms for them to live in. There's a sweet little ship bell that you can ring every time you want to set sail, which I don't know why is extremely important to me. You got a little I pot garden every time. Don't you love the pot garden yep. up top? Yeah, that's yep. pretty good. Yeah, it is. It's great. <laughs> It's it is so great. great. Um, and it's, you know, it's there to tell a very touching and, and kind of emotional story. I'm not too, too far in it, but right now just sailing around, learning about the world, collecting resources. It's kind of, I, I've heard it described and you can say whether or not this is accurate as sort of like a, a more story driven harvest moon type of experience. Yeah, I would say that there's, I mean, it definitely has that quality to it, except it's so much more. I mean, Harvest Moon and, and like Stardew Valley, those games are big towns and, you know, there's there's a lot of ground to cover in those games, whereas this is just this boat, really. But the same elements are kind of injected there. So, so uh, you know, fishing off the back of the boat while you're traveling and dealing with the kind of mini games that you have when you're going from one far point to another and you hit one of those like spirit uh, tornadoes or whatever they are. And you got to like try to knock out all the spirits on the on the boat while it's happening. Those things are pretty unique and, and interesting um, little events that happen, and they're always fun to do. But it's just a uh, it's hard to explain that game and why it works so well. I think I like that it feels like weirdly isolated, like you're on a boat mm -hmm. and these creatures that are with you, like they're all kind of effed up. And I don't know. They're, uh, you're also there's also this melancholy of like you're taking spirits to rest and you know you're basically the new river sticks person and there's just a there's a lot going on there but it's also uh how do i put this it's not anime okay in the in the normal sense even stylistically but it's got a a 
quality animated feeling to everything. Like just smooth and yeah. clean and and um and and small things that are just sort of delightful, like the way you cast your 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 uh your, your what do you call it, your fishing line or when you go to a town to go find stuff just the way that the locals look at you and and move like I, it's it's a difficult game to describe why it works so well but that's a great little game and it's on game Pass, i so love really the good. uh the saw blade animation where both you and the cat use your little light thing to create a saw and it's one of those you know push and pull and the cat doesn't contribute anything the cat just hangs from it and you just saw down a tree with it. And, it's like real uh, cats, by the way. They don't contribute anything. Just yeah, putting that out much there. like a real cat. Yeah. Just looked cute and hung out. Uh, I hugged a deer lady, and that that felt good. Yeah. <laughs> so she's your early. Uh, she, I think she's your earliest uh, person or uh, creature that you get. Yeah. Yeah. She likes hugs and smoking mm -hmm. and uh, different and comfort food. Yeah, and comfort uh, food. Don't feed her so, spicy stuff. She does not like it. No, I don't sorry. remember what it was I gave her, but she was like, absolutely. Oh, I gave, tried to give her a strawberry, and she was definitely opposed to the strawberry. Yeah. So it's got that whole component of like, find out what your locals like, and then take care of them. And the more you do, the more you learn about them, and then eventually you're going to find them their home. And But I think some of those creatures never leave because you need them for the places on the ship that they're in charge of and stuff. I don't know. It's a weird thing. It's a weird game. But even the like the transition to night when you're like sailing forever and it's like, oh, night's here. We have, we have to rest or whatever. Crawling up to your little thing and sleeping and just it's beautiful zoom out with like the sun dri dipping and then rising again. It's just the game just knows how to do tone. Almost better than anything I played last year. It's really good. Yeah, I don't know what the the term is or if it has a snappy term like asmr does for sounds but there's something atmospheric and visual about the whole piece that just it feels like a warm blanket whenever i'm playing it and i i really like it yeah it's real it's very good. good i'm glad you're playing that and you should continue hey look we have one of these that's a good question quick email here from jace long who says hey guys I'm here at 1.30 a.m. in Melbourne, Australia, and listening to your Star Wars game announcement show. I hear you trash-talking the 3DO, and it got me a bit worked up and all. Had to get out of bed and send you an email at 1.30 in the morning. <laughs> I love this so far. He says, uh, we never had a console here in Australia, or never had this console in Australia, yet Legend says it had an awesome version of Star Control 2 on it. That's true, it did. Uh, so there I was buying a 3DO from the U.S. on eBay, and I got this game as well. The PC version back in the day was great, but the legends of full talking aliens uh, and cutscenes on the 3DO version led me down this path. I had to buy a uh, <laughs> I had to buy a goddamn transformer box because our 240 volt system would have melted it. So I got this expensive power converter, a 3DO, and Star Control 2. Mind blown. I love, and damn it, I love the weirdness of my 3DO so much. Uh, it is so different from anything else I've played. All the crazy weird games this system put out. So, moral is, please don't trash talk the 3DO. It deserves a place in the annals of history just for being that, dor uh, sorry, just for being that dorky kid that no one liked. Sure, it had some of the really had some really really bad games. Sure, it was overpriced and outdated, piece of shit. But hell and damnation, it was one in a million. Something that should be cherished, uh, just because it was so weird. Just because I it didn't go, <laughs> sorry, it didn't go to the well traveled route, and just because it decided to be different and rant. Have a great New Year's. Cheers, Jace Long. He really likes the 3DO a lot. Sold okay. me on the 3DO. Yeah. I don't want one. But I appreciate it now. Yeah. As somebody who's, you know, you and I are one of the only people I know that had a Sega CDX. <laughs> and we know what it's like to have a weird console. Yep. Uh, and that no one else awesome, understands. Yeah. No and one, no gets one it. else knows how awesome it was. Nope. I mean, plenty of people probably saw that thing in a software, et cetera, and went, ooh, what's this? But just didn't pull the trigger. John and I, I went into debt to get that stupid thing. Like I put it on a credit card. <laughs> I asked my parents very hard to get that console. <laughs> yeah, you must have, because that's a hell of a buy. It was like 400 and something dollars or something. It was expensive. Well, we got it from, I can't remember the name of the place. It was called like Hastings. It was some place oh, where Hastings it wasn't Music. brand new. Yeah. 
Yeah. We had so that. I think we got it from a Hastings. I think we was used, but it was in great condition. I didn't sure. know better. No. And it worked fine. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, it. I think a lot of people saw the Sega CDX and thought it was a, a CD player, mm-hmm. like a Walkman. Yeah. Because that's what it looked like. Mm-hmm. And ignored it. But it was the best console. Yep. So good. It's what you want. Uh, all right. That's it. Emails. Uh, email us at uh, what is our thing? Oh, it's talk to the core at gmail.com. Talk to the core at gmail.com. And we'd love to read your email address or your email, not just your address, your entire email that you sent us. <laughs> we, <laughs> send us an email. We'll dox you. Just, That's right. <laughs> just give us your email address. We'll tell everybody what it was. Take that. Uh, but anyway, we'd love more. So get those coming to us. Talk to the core at gmail.com. As always, you can support this show at patreon.com slash core show. Hey, everybody, while you are uh, you have a minute out there, toss uh, toss Bo a little tweet, uh, Bo Schwartz on Twitter. And just tell him you're thinking about him. Hope he's doing all right, that sort of stuff. He's, uh, you know, he's, uh, you, you, you could use it. A little pat on the back from the community. So uh, do that for us, will you? Uh, you can also follow, find me and John on Twitter as well, John underscore Jagger. I'm at Scott Johnson. And the show is, of course, at Core Pod and uh, frogpants.com slash core for everything else you're looking for. Anything I forgot or missed, you'll find it there. That's going to do it for us. For me, for John. We'll see you next time. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Frog Pants Network. Get more shows like this at frogpants.com. Chat room says it launched at $6.99. Is that true? The CDX. That's crazy.